Hey, what's going on guys? Hope everyone had a really, really great week. Technical video this week and we're gonna talk a little bit more about virtual memory. If you need a refresher, please just watch my part one video on virtual memory. That was more of an introduction and intuition type video, but this week we're gonna get into a little more guts behind virtual memory, but please, please watch this first and I think this video will make a lot more sense. All right, tech video today, getting into some more details, nerding out a little bit, hope you enjoy it. Let's do it. Every single process running on your computer right now sees the exact same layout of memory. Obviously we know that that's not the same physical memory, but they see the exact same blueprint of virtual memory. Every single process sees it and everything works and the system just runs. It's, it's crazy and we should just appreciate it a little bit. So last video we talked about this blueprint idea. Well, what exactly goes inside that blueprint and that's the topic of this video. There was a really good blog post about this and I'm gonna put a link to the blog in my description but I'm just lifting the picture from that blog post and I'm gonna put it right here for the duration of the video and we're gonna take this picture and dissect every single section of the memory blueprint. So we're gonna start from the bottom go all the way to the top. I'm gonna to keep this picture here. It's probably not gonna make a sense right now, but by the end of the video, you're gonna know about every single one of these sections. All right, starting at the bottom, first section of this memory layout is where the processes program code and data are stored. And what exactly does that mean? Remember that every single process running on your computer right now, as you're watching this video, there's hundreds of processes running on your computer. Each one of those came from source code that somebody wrote at some point in time. You wrote a program, spent 100 hours, 10,000 hours, compiled it, built it down to an executable, and those are the executables that are running on your computer. Think of all the stuff that goes into writing a program, right? All those millions of lines of code that you wrote, all those lines have to be translated into machine instructions, and where do those machine instructions go? Where they go in this section of the memory. Second section, you're gonna see a section called the data segment and the BSS segment, but I'm gonna actually group this into one section. This section of memory is gonna hold static data from your program. If you're a C or C++ developer, the word static might pop up in your head, but static variables hold a special place in this section. For anyone that doesn't really know C or what the word static really means. I think a good way to intuitively understand what static means is to think about not dynamic. Let's just talk about dynamic data a little bit, all right? If you're watching this video on Chrome, you can just hit new tab 100 times, right? You could hit it one time, you could hit it two times. The programmer would never know how many times you're gonna hit tab. So every time you hit tab, it's gonna take up more memory. Chrome's gonna take up more memory. Every time you close a tab, Chrome might free up some memory. What's another example? Let's say, let's say you program the to-do list, right? You program the to-do list and you give it to your friend. Well, you don't know if your friend's gonna make one to-do item or 10 items, right? It's all very dynamic memory. So dynamic memory is something that the programmer can't control, right? You can't control as a programmer how many tabs the user opens in Chrome. Well, static memory is just literally the opposite of dynamic. You know exactly which data you need and how much of it. So if you're a programmer, let's just say you need 10 megabytes of data and you know you need 10 megabytes of data. Nothing more, nothing less, it's just static. My program needs these 10 megabytes to run. Where are those 10 megabytes gonna be stored? Well, they're gonna be stored in this section of memory for static variables. All right, third section. Going up from the top, third section, if you can see it right here, it's called the heap. And this is gonna be a really easy section to explain based on what we just talked about. The heap, the heap is actually where all that dynamic data goes and is allocated. All those Chrome tabs, all those to-do list items, any data that's really dynamic and determined at runtime, it's gonna go in the heap. So you can imagine that the heap grows and shrinks all the time, it's very dynamic, right? If you keep making tabs in Chrome, you're gonna use more memory and the heap's gonna grow. If you close tabs in Chrome, the heap might shrink. So this is all very runtime specific. And what does runtime really means? It just means that the allocation happens when the program is running. 
If you've programmed in C before, I'm sure you've used the function malloc, which allocates memory in the heap for you. If you use C++, there's a new, which does the same thing, but mostly any dynamic runtime type of memory that you need is gonna go into this heap, all right? So heap, hopefully it's intuitive, just a very dynamic space to allocate memory. All right, we're on to our fourth section, going up from the diagram, just follow the diagram up. The fourth section of the layout is called the memory mapping section. It sounds really complicated, but it's a really, really simple idea. The memory mapped region of this virtual memory layout is actually a very special section where the program or the process can access files on your computer. That's pretty crazy if you think about it, right? It's just a file. It's sitting on the computer, on your hard drive, on your flash drive. It's just a file persisted, a bunch of bytes persisted in your computer somewhere. So why would you ever want to access files in your program? But one major use case of accessing files inside any running program is to utilize shared libraries. I made a quick video about shared versus static libraries that I'll link to right here, but you should definitely watch that if you need a refresher, but shared libraries is implemented in this section. Quick 10 second recap on shared libraries. Remember that a shared library is a very special file that sits somewhere in the computer. It's actually a file, but the program can access that shared library at runtime exactly when it needs it. On the flip side of shared libraries, remember that we had static libraries and static libraries are actually code and functionality that are included in your program at compile time. So they actually make your program bigger. And if you use a lot of static libraries, your program itself grows and all that static functionality would actually be included in the, the bottom section where all the program data is stored. The major takeaway of this special section is that this allows your program to actually access files just anywhere in your computer. So it's pretty cool. All right, fifth section going up from the top, fifth section, if you can see it right here, it's called the stack. This is a very simple, very cool section and hopefully it's easy to understand. So a stack is used to manage function calls in a program and every single program uses a lot of functions or a lot of methods or a lot of routines, what have you, but deep down inside it's all implemented the same way. So you have function A, it goes into function B, function B goes into function C, function C goes into function D, but oh crap, function D is done. So we have to make sure we know the right place to return to in function C. But all that management, all that function calling and returning, all that stuff is managed by the stack. So you can imagine that the stack, kind of like the heap, it's very dynamic, right? If your program, if the program you wrote uses a lot of functions, you call like 100 functions, the stack's gonna be utilized a lot. If your program is one huge function, it makes no function calls, it's like 10 million lines, then you might not use a stack very often if you never use functions. All right, so that's the stack. Hopefully it's really clear managing function calls throughout a program. Okay, sixth, six, this is the last section that we're gonna talk about for this video, but the sixth section all the way at the top, you can see that there's a special gigabyte of space reserved for kernel memory. This one gigabyte of space for the kernel is actually a very special area of memory and it's kind of a privileged section of memory. Privileged meaning that no matter what you do as a programmer, you can never access this type of memory. It's kind of like off limits. If you ever try to manually write a program or write some code to access or read data from the privileged section, your program will just crash. The important thing to know about this kernel space is that Remember, all software that runs on your computer sees virtual memory, right? All software that you write, or actually any software that's running on your computer sees memory, sees the virtual memory layout, and that includes kernel software, because at the end of the day, kernel is the software too. The kernel, that special part of the operating system, that is also software that someone wrote somewhere. So this special reserve section for the kernel software is always present in the layout of every single process. Every single process, their memory layout, they're gonna see that kernel code at the top and there's nothing a programmer or a user can really do about it. All right guys, that's the end of the video. Definitely glossed over a lot of itty bitty details, but all the sections that we covered are really important sections 
of any program or any process that's running on your computer. So just take a moment and maybe again, we appreciate everything the operating system does. Virtual memory is just one out of ton of shit that the OS does that's just magical. All right guys, so I put a link in the description that goes to that blog post, but that blog post has a lot more details than what we talked about in this video. I try to hit the very top level, like core concepts of virtual memory, but if you want to learn about some more details and cool stuff, check out that post, Google it some more, and just read about it. All right guys, so that's it. Virtual memory, the memory layout that every single process on your computer sees magical stuff hopefully this was a fun video even though it's a little bit technical but hope everyone enjoyed it please leave me a comment ask me any questions do your own research and oh yeah subscribe i forgot about that but anyways have a great week kill it all that stuff and i'll see you in the next video